Good morning. It's nice to have you here in God's house this morning, as always. We've had a lot of different sermons lately. Um, preached a couple of sermons about the one. And if you were here last week or four or five weeks ago, you wrote down the name uh, probably on a little card and put it on that board over there. And we said that's the person we're going to identify as someone who needs Jesus. We're going to pray for them, focus on them, look for opportunities to witness to them, invite them to church. So we had a couple of sermons on the one. We had confirmation in there. Um, we had um, Mother's Day in there. We did a, a sermon series called Every Parent's Jerusalem where we talked about the necessity of parents being equipped to share the faith with their children. So it dawned on me that we were going to have someone else preach today, but he let us know about 10 days ago that he wasn't able to make it today. And so I knew that I was going to be on deck today. And I said to myself, what is it that I need to preach that I haven't preached for a while? And I came up with the subject of salvation, grace. I haven't talked about what it means to be saved or how a person is saved since really Easter. And so for some of us here today, this is going to be a very fundamental, down-to-earth, law, gospel, sin, salvation kind of message. But you know what? That's okay. Because we need that. Because at the end of life, and we don't know when that's going to be, uh, some of you probably are going to be here for 30, 40, 50, maybe 70 years yet. Some of us may be called home today. We just don't know. But whenever it is, we always want to be ready. Amen? We want to know beyond the shadow of a doubt where we're going to spend eternity. Because eternity is forever. And our life here is like a mist. It's here and then it's gone. You've heard this analogy before. Our life here compared to eternity is like one inch of string compared to a string that stretches from L.A. to New York City. Let that sink in just for a minute. So it's important for us to understand, is heaven really open to me? And if it is... How do I get there? My thoughts go back to 1996 during the Lenten season at Ascension Lutheran Church in El Paso, Texas. I was a senior pastor there before being called here. We had four little kids, and even though we lived in El Paso, Texas, we would consistently see these commercials about an amusement park in San Antonio, Texas called Fiesta, Texas. And this commercial would come on consistently. And the kids would bug me, Dad, Dad, can't we go there? Can't we go there? We want to go there so bad. And finally I said in 1996, okay kids, the day after Easter, after Lent and Holy Week is over, we're going to pack up the car, we're going to drive 600 miles, we're going to spend the week in San Antonio, and on Tuesday we're going to go to Fiesta, Texas. Yes, yes, that's great, Dad. We'll be in all this celebration. Well, days passed, and finally it was time for that day. Monday came, the Monday after Easter. We packed up the car. We traveled 600 miles, a 10 hour trip down I 10, got to San Antonio about 6 o'clock at night, and, um, and there, off in the distance, just a couple miles away, was the roller coaster of Fiesta, Texas. So my oldest son said, Dad, Let's go look at it, just to get a foretaste of what's going to happen tomorrow. Let's go look at it and get really pumped. And so we drove to it, got to the parking lot, and the parking lot was empty. It was closed. This place was closed. We traveled all this way, and it wasn't open on, until the weekend. How many of you have seen National Lampoon's Vacation? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember when Chevy Chase makes that trip, you know, across the country, blah, 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 and gets there and finds out it's closed? And you remember what he did to the little, little icon? This is what he did, okay? Okay. Now, that's what I felt like doing, you know? I was so upset. He said, I can't believe it. We traveled this whole way. Fiesta, Texas isn't open until Friday. So we spent time in a Howard Johnson's 8x10 hotel room for the next five days waiting for, for Fiesta, Texas, finally to be open. Have you ever showed up at something expecting it to be open and it wasn't? 
It was closed. One of the fundamental questions we want to answer today is, is heaven open to me? And maybe you're thinking, you know, I haven't been good enough, or I haven't obeyed the commandments well enough, or I look back over the track record of my life and I've made so many mistakes, and I wonder, is heaven open to somebody like me? And the answer is, unequivocally, without reservation, without hesitation, the answer is yes! Heaven is open to you. Why? Well, here's the number one reason. Jesus goes or has already gone to prepare a place for you. Now, when Jesus said these words, it was in the upper room the day before he's crucified. He's celebrating the Lord's Supper. He says all kinds of other things found in the book of John. I mean, like four chapters of dialogue between Jesus and his disciples and him doing a lot of teaching. But primarily, he was preparing them for the future. And also, he was celebrating the Lord's Supper with his disciples for the very first time. And he says these words. I want you to go ahead and read it with me. Let's read it. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? What's Jesus saying? He's saying, I'm going to prepare the way. I'm going to make preparations. Now, I used to think that, you know, before we die, Jesus knows when we're going to die, and he's up there, up in heaven, you know, getting out his nail gun, hammering some boards together, putting together a mansion, and finally when the mansion is done, he calls us home. Is that what Jesus means here? Absolutely not. What preparations did Jesus go through to make eternal life possible and heaven open to us here's what he did he died and he rose again and so the preparations jesus needed to carry out to make heaven a reality to make heaven open to us is his death and resurrection you might say well what did he do on the cross he died for your sins he paid the full penalty for your wrongs every sin of your life was laid on Jesus. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Where was Jesus sacrificed? On Calvary's cross. And on the cross, he died for your sins. And if you say, I'm not good enough, he couldn't have died for that specific sin of my life. He did. It's finished. No matter how grievous your sin is, no matter how horrible you feel about that particular sin, he even died for that. He even died for that. I got to tell you, I went to the Colorado prayer luncheon on Thursday at the, the Colorado Convention Center. It was awesome. And the most compelling speaker was the mayor of the city of Denver, Michael Hancock. He hit it out of the park. And he said, you know, I went to Israel recently and it was a transformational trip for me. And we went to the place of the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus was probably buried. And one of the questions I asked our tour guide was, where did they find the cross? What happened to the cross? And the tour guide said, well, centuries ago they found the cross in a heap of rubble and debris. And I don't know what happened to the cross after that, but that's where they found it. And I started thinking, in the midst of our rubble and debris of sin is laid the cross, right? Amen? And from that cross radiates love and forgiveness and peace from God at the cross. And then Michael Hancock went on to say there was a group of Christians who were together who were looking at the various sites and they stood about a wall or two above him and all of a sudden he heard this singing as they looked over the site where the possible cross was. And this is what they were singing. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. My prayer is that you see the light of Jesus' love and salvation figuratively at the cross, that you understand that Jesus Christ died for your sins and paid in full the penalty for all of your sins at the cross. And may you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, look at the cross of Jesus and say, at the cross, at the cross, I first saw the light. 
This is the preparation that Jesus made to make heaven open for us. But not only his death, his resurrection three days later. You guys know that if we believed in a dead king and not a living savior, you wouldn't be here today. But Jesus defeated death, triumphed over the grave, and lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. His death, his resurrection opens up heaven for us, and these are the preparations he has made. Secondly, he goes to prepare and will be with him. He goes to prepare and will be with him. Look at what this says. This, remember, Jesus is saying this to his disciples. Let's read it together, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I've heard a lot of different definitions of heaven, but the best one, being with Christ. Did you hear what Jesus said? So that where I am, there you're going to be too. St. Paul said this, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. In other words, when I leave this earth, I know I'm going to be with my Savior. Many of you have lost loved ones down through the years, and when they died, what did you say? They went to be with the Lord. They went to be with Jesus. I oftentimes, when I read the New Testament, wish I could have been there to see Jesus turn water into wine, to see Jesus walk on water, to see Jesus still the storm, to see Jesus cleanse the lepers, to see Jesus rise from the dead, to have a face-to-face -face encounter with the living Savior. But when we pass on, we get it, and we'll be so enveloped so surrounded, so circumferenced by the love and the peace and the mercy of Christ, he'll be all we need. I remember coming back from Disneyland years ago with our four older kids, and my oldest son, who was 12 at the time, said this, Dad, what is heaven like? And I said, son, I was trying to think of it, you know, how do I put this in a 12-year-old term, you know? And I said, son, it's going to be so great, it's going to be even better than Disneyland. And you know what he said? Ha uh ah, -uh. no way. What's going to make it so great? It says it right here, guys. So that where he is, we're going to be there too. How many of you want that? Raise your hand. How many of you want to be in a place where there's suffering and pain and loneliness no more? If you want that, raise your hand. It's open to you. You're not gonna, here's the deal. You're not going to show up in heaven and it's going to be closed. And God is going to say, come back on the weekend. <laughs> it's open. Why? Because he prepares the way and will be with him. And finally, thirdly, He's the way. He's the way. There is no other way. I, I, you know, I don't know if we're going to put this on the air or not, but I got to tell you, the Pope, and not, not to pick on religious leaders, but the Pope has said some pretty radical stuff. Do you guys know what some of the stuff he said? That Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Christians, Jews, we all worship the same God. Did you hear that? What? what? This is Trinity Sunday. And we believe in the triune God, and only Christians believe in the, listen to this, Hindus don't believe this, Buddhists don't believe this, Mohammedans don't believe this, even Jewish people unconverted to Christianity don't believe this. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's our God. And Jesus is the only way to heaven. There is no other way. There's not the Buddhist way, the Hindu way, the Muslim way, the Jewish way, the Mormon way, the Jehovah Witness way, the Universalist way, the do your best and pull yourself up by your bootstraps way. There's only one way to salvation, and that way is Jesus Christ. Amen?
That's the only way. Who said that? Well, Pastor Dave, that's your opinion, right? No way. Look at this verse. Let's read it together. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. What's he mean by that? By repentance and faith in Jesus Christ alone. That is the only way that heaven is open to us. By repentance, God, I'm sorry for my sins, and I lay them on you, Lord Jesus, who died for them, and I believe, Jesus, that you're the Son of God and the Savior of the world who died for sin and died for sinners and died for me on that cross. I believe in that. You're in. You're in. You might come back to me and say, well, don't I have to do a bunch of stuff to get in? No. Don't I have to jump through a bunch of religious hoops to get there? No. Don't I have to do the, keep the Ten Commandments to get there? No. Don't I have to live a righteous life to get there? No. Now, I will say that when you know Jesus, you want to live a righteous life, amen? You want to obey the commandments of God. You want to do the right thing. You want to make the right choices. You want to honor God with your life. All as a result of what Christ has done for us at the cross in the empty tomb because he is the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. I'll never forget when I was uh, at a gas station years ago in Tobias, Nebraska, and this lady asked me, how do I get to Lincoln? And I said, well, the first thing you got to do is head north on this road, and then you turn right on this road, and then you go on Highway 15, and that eventually gets you to uh, Interstate 80, and then you turn right on Interstate 80, and, you know, the signs will get you there. Just watch the signs. But the most important thing is you got to head north on this road right here. She said, thank you very much. She got in her car, and instead of heading north, she started heading south. Now, I had told her clearly how to get there. I had told her, all you got to do is follow the signs. I'm telling you clearly today that heaven is open to you, and Jesus is the way, and there is no other way. Only Christ. Only Christ. At the cross, at the cross, where we first saw the light. Two weeks ago, my wife and I went on vacation. And we went to a place called Carbondale, Colorado. I don't know how many of you have been there. It is flat out gorgeous. It's between Glenwood Springs and Aspen. And about 50 miles from Carbondale, maybe less than that, is a beautiful place called the Maroon Bells. Have you seen these? These are the most picturesque mountains, most photographed mountains in the entire state. As a matter of fact, they are the second most photographed mountains, second to only the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. It is spectacular scenery, and really the picture doesn't do it justice. So I said to my son and my wife, I said, we're, we went camping, we have a little pop-up camper, we were there for, for a couple days, and the first day we were there on a Tuesday, I said, let's go drive up to Maroon Bell. So we go up there, and uh, we get four miles away, and the gate is closed. <laughs> I'm going, are you kidding me? So we go on a little hike. Of course, it's a four-mile trek all the way to Maroon Bells. Four-mile trek from this closed gate. Well, I knew that, you know, we probably wouldn't do eight miles. And so we walk for a ways, and we're coming back, and, you know, this very athletic lady is running along, and, and uh, she said, did you get to see him? We said, no, we didn't make it. And she said, oh, it's spectacular. But don't worry, it's open on Friday. The gates are open on Friday, so come on up. Guess what happened? We go up to the gate on Friday. Guess what? It's closed. I'm going, are you kidding me? So, so I, I told my little boy, I said, look, you got to see this. We're going to go up in July, you know, when there's no way the gate will be closed. But you know what I'm going to do? Before we go, I'm going to make a phone call, and I'm going to make sure it's open, okay? Do you know what our phone call is? 
from God to us that the gates are open? The Word of God. The Word of God tells us today clearly that Jesus goes to prepare, will be with Him, and He is the way. And as a result of that, heaven is open to you. Thanks be to God that heaven is open. Amen? Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you so much that you've given us salvation through your Son, that it's not dependent on us, that our sin separates us from you. And as a result of that, the gap of sin needs to be bridged. And Lord Jesus Christ, you bridged the gap through your death and resurrection. And all we have to do by the Holy Spirit's power is repent of our sin and put our trust in you, Lord Jesus. I know that maybe 90% of us already are in. We already believe. But for those 10% today who may be on the fence, Holy Spirit, nudge them onto the other side. Help them to see that Jesus is the only way to heaven, that there is no other way, and we can validate that simply because of his resurrection. No other religious leader rose from the dead but our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you defeated death and opened up heaven to all those who trust in your name. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would send a Holy Spirit's anointing upon anyone here today who still is not in and that you would move them to say, yep, I'm in. I trust in Jesus. He died and he rose again for me. Heaven is open to me today. I pray that all. In the saving and powerful and unparalleled name of you, Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Savior of all, and we love you. In your precious name, we pray all these things. Amen.